I want to welcome you to another special prayer episode of Pod for Israel, and I have with us Dr. Seth Postel, and we're going to be diving in to the prayer of Daniel, how to pray for Israel, but this is way bigger than just praying for Israel. This is praying for the nations, praying for ourselves uh, biblically. Let's dive into Daniel in prayer. Yeah, so Daniel obviously is a man of prayer. We know this from chapter six, where he had a regular time of prayer, and he would go up three times a day and and pray. He would face towards Jerusalem, obviously, uh, even far away from that city. He knew that God God was at work and God would keep his promises. But uh, in chapter six of Daniel, we actually don't really know what he was praying, right? We just know that he prayed. And earlier on in chapter two, we also know that Daniel prayed when he sought God's wisdom to understand, you know, their, their lives were in danger. And so, yeah. He sought wisdom to know what Nebuchadnezzar had actually dreamed. And then we see that he praises God. But in terms of what he prayed for his people, obviously his heart was on Jerusalem. We know this. He faced Jerusalem in chapter 6. Chapter 9 is a really important passage. Um, I think it's an important passage not just for um, praying for Israel, but praying in general. And it's the one passage in Daniel where we see Daniel actually reading scripture, uh. which I really find to be amazing. He's actually, he's reading scripture, um, more than likely Jeremiah chapter 25, uh. also uh, quite possibly Jeremiah 29, but you know, Jeremiah. And he's, he's wrestling over the 70 years and the meaning of 70 years and you know, what, you know, and so he's obviously burdened and he's praying um, mm. the, the scripture, which has shaped his prayers. But what I also see in this passage, which I find to be really amazing, is that he's not just working through Jeremiah. In other words, it's clear to me from his prayer that uh, he's been reading Jeremiah, but he's also been meditating on the Torah. Mm. Right. And so, for instance, he's looking at Leviticus 26, which warned Israel of an exile and spoke mm. about you know the possibility of forgiveness and a regathering, mm. and so you can also see that Daniel's prayers were really being shaped by the promises of God, by the warnings of God, mm. um, by the prophets of God, by Moses. Wow, yeah. If my people are called, who are called by my name, will turn. It's like you could see he. he this was on his mind as he came to that scripture. Yeah. It's clear that let, let's put it. Let me put it to you a different way, and just simply say that Daniel's prayer uh, was basically the scriptures. It was basically mm. holding up to God. Um, he was rehearsing God's warnings, which had come to pass. Right. We have sinned. We have failed. Mm -hmm. You know, he's he's rehearsing the truth of Scripture about his people. Uh, he actually is including himself. Yeah, that's a key thing. Well, Golan and I spoke about that on our last prayer podcast. We talked about Daniel included himself. Even though he was a righteous man, he, he said, we have sinned, we have. So he, he, mm -hmm. he didn't disassociate himself from the narrative of faith from his forefathers. And that was kind of the sin that, that Yeshua pointed out to the Pharisees that they were trying to disassociate. If we would have lived in the days, we wouldn't have partaken with the death of their father, you know, the prophets. And so that's something key. Is it's like that humility and association with the forefathers for better and worse, I guess you could say, as we pray. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so seeing himself as a part, mm -hmm. um, he suffered with his people right. as part of the people we, mm. right? Um, you know, it's interesting. I have a friend, who uh, a Gentile that actually grew up uh, in Uganda. He's he's British, but he grew up in Uganda, and uh, he's now in Israel. But what what's interesting about him is that he was in boarding school as a young man in Uganda, Uganda, and uh, he was praying, and he suddenly found himself praying for Israel, huh. and he shocked himself because he started praying for my people. Wow. And he had never been to Israel. I don't even think he'd ever known a Jewish person. Hmm. 
but it so moved him, this suddenly catching himself praying for my people, right? Yeah. And um, just this close identification. And obviously, I'm not speaking about replacement theology at all, but, right. but the fact is, is that that one prayer for the people of Israel, maybe through the eyes of the prophets, through the eyes of Daniel, yeah. um, resulted in him actually coming here and um, serving right. the people of Israel. So his prayers actually became yeah. deeds. That's right? beautiful. Which is really neat. That's beautiful. Um, but I think that I think what I learned from Daniel here is that um, if we want to pray right for Israel, if we want to pray right for the nations, we want to ask according to God's heart. Right. You know, we're going to pray God's will. Mm-hmm. So I've oftentimes, I've, you know, you hear prayers sometimes in the context of public prayers, and people will ask things that you know are not biblical. Right, they, they, yeah. they, you, you know for a fact that you're asking for something that God can't say yes to because yeah. you're praying for something that God never promised, and in fact, the scriptures teach quite quite, quite the contrary. Right. So it seems to me that um, learning to pray is reading the Bible, right? Pouring over the scriptures, uh, pouring over the the promises of God, hmm. reminding God of the promises. Hmm. Um, I think that's that's a really, it's crucial to the way that we're going to be praying for Israel. Yeah, you look at, this wasn't just Daniel's thing too. David also was very big into reminding God of his own promises. If you read through the Psalms, which are prayers, these are prayers that are poured out, worship and, and prayer together. And time and time again, that's how he built up his faith, reminding God of what he said, of the covenants that he made. And like you were saying, we're grafted into that. That's a beautiful, that's a beautiful picture of, of it. We are, it, we are praying as one together. You know, whether you're Jewish or Gentile, uh, as we pray for Israel, it's part of our story too, as we've been grafted into that. You know, there is... Interestingly enough, I think Romans 11 really deals with this symbiotic relationship between Jews and Gentiles in the program of God. Hmm. And so, you know, Paul says in Romans 11, 11, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel jealous, right? In chapter 12, he, or chapter 11, verse 12, he says something really interesting that I'm going to paraphrase. He says, now if their rejection, i.e. Israel's rejection of Jesus is blessing for the Gentiles, mm. then how much more will their fullness bring? In other words, if the, Jewish, if the Jewish people's rejection of Jesus resulted in blessing for the Gentiles, right. how much more blessing will come to the Gentiles when Israel accepts Jesus? Mm. So then Paul goes on to talk about, you know, uh, Salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel jealous. And so what does he do? Therefore, I'll magnify my ministry among the Gentiles Mm. so as to provoke some. Here's the crazy thing here in the plan of God. The Gentile evangelism is Jewish evangelism. In other words, reaching the pygmies in in Australia, reaching the ends of the earth Mm. is part of God's purpose and plan of provoking Israel to jealousy. So we can't even separate Jewish and Gentile evangelism in the plan of God. Mm. To pray for the salvation of Israel is to love the nations, right? Right. To long for fuller blessings to come upon the nations through the fullness of mm. Israel. And just an example of that in recent history that I've seen is we look at what happened during the Six Day War? One, I know a lot of the main leaders in Messianic Judaism today came to faith right during that whole time, right during that year. Many of them came to faith, separate places across the United States and all over the world, and who are leaders today in that movement. Also, we saw the birth of the Jesus movement. You know, of basically one of the biggest, you know awakenings that sent missionaries all over the world, people returning back to God. So there. Already, even in recent history, we've seen that correlation of this little burst of light that came to the Jewish people and to the nations together. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 
Absolutely. So how do we pray uh, scripturally? What's some tips that you would give for us as we, you know, because prayer time, sometimes you'll, you'll get five minutes in and you'll be like, oh, okay, and what else? And I think praying through scripture is a great structure to really give you some focus in your prayer time. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, if we're going to pray biblically, right? Yeah. So how about, you know, Romans chapter 10? Let me, let me open it up. I mean, Paul tells us very clearly uh, in Romans chapter 10. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. Right. Right. I mean, that's, that's something we pray for. Lord, mm-hmm. I pray for their salvation. Um, it's crucial. Mm-hmm. Right. Psalm 122, is it 122, talks about praying for the, the peace of Jerusalem, right? As I understand that prayer, I, I think that we tend to disassociate that with, it's almost like we pray that prayer in ice, separately from its connectivity with the messianic promises. In other mm-hmm. words, what, is it, what does it mean today to pray for the peace of Jerusalem? Does it mean that there won't be any conflict in Israel? Well, we know according to Zechariah 12, we know according to Zechariah 14, there will be conflict in Israel. Right. So to pray there's no conflict in Israel, is that, is that a biblical prayer? Does that, what it mean? Does that what it mean to pray for the peace of Jerusalem? As I understand it, you know, as I understand it, the, the, the world will never be set right until Jesus is sitting on his throne in Jerusalem. Right. Right? It's, it's almost like a thy kingdom come. Mm. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come mm-hmm. quickly. Yeah. You know, Romans chapter 8 talks about the, the, the creation is groaning. Mm. You know, I like to, you know, yeah. I like to think about, you know, what, what does that even mean? So if I took you right now outside the, the college and we put our ear on a tree and we listened really carefully with a, seth- a stethoscope. A stethoscope. A stethoscope, right? <laughs> and we put that stethoscope on the trunk of the tree. You, you know what you would hear? Oi, <sighs> oi, right? Yeah. Creation is groaning. Yeah. So this also orients our prayer. So a lot of times people think about our hope is leaving. Hmm. But that's, that's a bailout. That's a cop-out. Yes. Absent from the body's present from the Lord, or present with the Lord. Yeah. But that's not the the orientation of hope is not our going, but His coming. Right. We long for creation's bondage to be broken. Yeah. So a longing for the Lord to return, and until then, a longing for their salvation, the Jewish people's yeah. salvation. You that's know, right. what does that mean to pray for their salvation? Obviously, it would be. Uh, to pray for for workers, for people that mm. understand the program of God, for people to understand Romans one sixteen that the gospel, you know, is to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Yeah, you know, even to pray again. We talked about this when Paul says, "I find this to be an interesting passage." Let me read it again. Romans eleven eleven. I say then. They did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be, but by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Now, if their transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? In other words, a longing for Israel's salvation is a longing for all the nations to be saved, right? right? To love Israel is to love the nations. But now here's the next verse he says, and to evangelize the nations Mm -hmm. is to reach Israel. Verse 13, but I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I'm an apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. Dear God, please bring a revival to to Kathmandu. Dear God, please bring a revival to Syria. Please bring a revival to the Ukraine. Please bring a revival to Moscow, to Russia, to, to Afghanistan. Why? I magnify my ministry if somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. In other words, even here, longing for revival, longing for Israel's salvation is, 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 is loving the Gentiles, yeah. and longing for the Gentile salvation is longing for God to provoke the remnant. Wow. It's a cycle. <laughs> it's, it's, a bu- it's symbiotic. It's yeah, a beautiful it relationship. And so these are the kinds of things. I, th- I think our prayer life has to be oriented towards, right? It has to be oriented towards the Great Commission as right. I see it, right? Yeah. 
Now, yeah. obviously, we pray for leaders. Obviously, right. we pray for, you know, uh, what does he say in, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2? It's really interesting. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, let me open that up here. First of all, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions, and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men or all people, right? right. For kings and all who are in authority. Why? So that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Well, what does that mean? This is good and acceptable in the, in the sight of God our Savior, who, and here's the key, verse 4, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there's only one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all the testimony given at the proper time. Here's what's really interesting. Paul says, pray for leaders so that we can live a tranquil and quiet life. I don't think he's talking about being Trappist monks here. Yeah. I think he's praying for a tranquil periods so that we can proclaim the gospel. Why? Because God desires all men or all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And mm -hmm. so when we pray for rulers, even that has to be oriented towards our passion for the Great Commission. Right. Right? And here's the good news even in here is that God raises up leaders. He sets down leaders. You know, As yeah. we pray even, you know, one of the things I've been really challenged to pray for, you know, I, I keep thinking about Nebuchadnezzar eating, having long fingernails and, and eating grass in the field <laughs> and then finally praying this prayer, right? He became, he became a Baptist at the end of his prayer, <laughs> right? He became a, yeah. <laughs> joking, he, came, he became a follower of Je Jesus yeah. in this amazing prayer. I pray that the world leaders that are most arrogant, right. that seem most dangerous, that God would, would make them eat grass, I, right? I, so that they would repent. I've thought about that a lot, of that, that time, you know, where Israel was in exile was really a time of great mercy, of great evangelism, you could say, to the world. Think of how many decrees... Nebuchadnezzar made towards the gods of Israel that went to every tribe, tongue, and nation of the world. It's crazy. And then what happened with Cyrus? This was not done in a corner. And it was like God was proclaiming his name amongst the Gentiles while they were in exile and then showing them by bringing them back. It was, it was really amazing. What a witness. Absolutely. And listen, what God, whatever God does for Israel... It's always for the sake of the nations as well, right? Yeah. So when we're praying for Israel, Psalm chapter 98 uh, is really beautiful. Psalm chapter 98, I'll read from verse 1. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, uh, for he has done wonderful things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained victory for him. The Lord has made, made, his salvation, uh, the Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. Listen to this, verse 3. Yeah. He has remembered his loving kindness and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation wow. of our God. Shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Hmm. So it's really interesting. We pray and we remind God of his promises, his faithfulness to Israel. Right. Why? So that all the ends will see the salvation of our God. So that all the nations of the earth will <clears throat> shout joyfully. Right. Amen. So again, I, I guess coming back to the issues of prayer and how do we pray um, for Israel, uh, as I see it, I think we have to be we have to be immersed in the Word of God. We have to be immersed in the directionality of Scripture, the hope of Scripture, the longing right. of the prophets, the promises of the prophets. Hmm. Um, and and to me, any prayer that's kind of a prayer that's divorced of the great commission is 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 not a biblical prayer not for israel nor for the nations right it's all to that end mm -hmm. unto him for him and to him and through him all things right mm -hmm. so you know i i just even think of why where do we get off track where do we kind of get into the i'll fly away or just take me home mentality of hope instead of the biblical hope is much bigger than that. I was reading with my kids uh, last night, and we were talking about, in Ezekiel, it talks about God speaking to the mountains of Israel, talking about, I'm going to make men walk upon you again, multiply men upon you again. And 
and gather them to you and you'll no longer be, you know, called a land that bereaves its children and stuff. And my daughter was saying, why, daddy, why are they talking about the land? Why is God speaking to the mountains? There's something covenantal, I guess, that you only understand. There's something of the covenant. There's something of the of the promises that speak to the nations when he's speaking to this nation. And it's it, it, if you don't read through the whole Bible, you miss that narrative. If you're just reading a little bit in just the Gospels and here and there, you're missing the whole narrative that God's trying to tell. Of that's better than us just escaping away, but there's something even greater, a greater glory that's coming. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that the the whole notion of leaving this place, and I understand it because <laughs> it's we live in tough times, and mm. you know, I, I imagine tougher times are on their way, right? Yeah, so I so. understand the desire to leave this place, but to a certain extent, it 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 almost creates a a false dichotomy mm. between matter and spirit, hmm. body and spirit, so that spiritual is good, body is bad, mm. right? And so I've got to leave this body, I've got to leave this earth, but by virtue of the fact that God became flesh. We have an embodied God forever, hmm. right? God made flesh to dwell among us, and the hope of Him returning is crucial, also for our hope for this earth, for this planet, that God would right. renew this planet, right? We we again search the scriptures, and you will see that again and again the orientation, both of the prophets and the apostles, is the coming of the Lord. Yeah. His return. Right. And if we should fall asleep before that time, mm. there's hope. Right. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. But thy kingdom come. Amen. Well, that's beautiful. Well, uh, Lord, I just ask that as we pray and as we read your scripture, that you would give us insights and in prayer. That, Lord, you would dive us into your word in a deeper way uh, that as we discover more of your heart through reading scripture you would help us to be able to pray for Israel and pray for the nations uh, in a deeper way with greater understanding and empowered by and led by your spirit. I ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. If this touched your heart will you help pay it forward so that others can hear the same message of life? partner with our team to bring the gospel to Israel and the nations.